<laughs> that is one big pile of shit. Now, this could be it. We may be in some multiverse where I don't even exist. Don't knock rationalization. Where would we be without it? Yes, yes. Yes, without the use. To take them, take them out, take them down. Do your, do your stuff. Life uh, finds a way. Hello and welcome to episode 7 of The Complete Works, a deep dive into the career and films of actor Jeff Goldblum. My name is Mike Smith and joining me on this journey into the wondrous world of Goldblum is my friend, co-host, and fellow Goldblum maniac, Mike DiCrescio. How you doing today, Mike? I'm doing great. It's another weekly episode of, of Goldblum Pod. Uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful day to be alive. Yeah, and this will be a weekly podcast for the foreseeable future because so far there's really no end in sight to the uh, nope. coronavirus stuff and uh, movies coming back on track. Just don't see it happening anytime soon. <laughs> no. So we may be on to season three much sooner than we ever expected uh, here at Complete Works. It, it took us four years to get through Nicolas Cage. It'll take us six months to get through Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah. uh, not, probably not even that quick, but <laughs> no. Goldblum's in a lot of movies, too. Uh, now, every once in a while, a movie will come along out of nowhere and completely take the public by storm, totally changing the game and wielding a massive influence on pop culture from that point forward. This is not one of those movies, but it is <laughs> one of the movies that came out of one of those movies. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, one side effect is that a lot of movies will get made in the years following that movie that are attempts to capitalize on what people liked about that. So, for example, after Pulp Fiction, we were hit with a bunch of movies trying to ape Tarantino's dialogue and penchant for sudden violence, play for laughs. After Star Wars, there was a mad rush of sci-fi and space adventure movies. After Twilight, we got a rush of other adaptations of young adult romance novels. And in 1973, The Exorcist was released and kicked off a whole wave of supernatural horror movies involving elements like the Catholic Church or demonic possession. Those movies included hits like The Omen, uh, which itself spawned a franchise, cult classics like God Told Me To and Eyes of Laura Mars, the first Stephen King adaptation with Carrie, and it includes the movie we're talking about today, 1977's The Sentinel. It's one of the nicer tree line blocks in New York, and only 20 minutes from the center of town. Oh, and just around the corner, there's a supermarket and the cleaners. That's Father Harron in 5A. He's blind. Blind? Well, then what does he look at? There is danger everywhere. There is evil. Evil everywhere. Turn around, Allison. Look behind you. There is horror. There is darkness. I think Allison may die. But watching, waiting, warding off evil, there is hope. The Sentinel. Before Halloran, there was Father David Spinetti. Before him, Mary Thorin becomes Sister Mary Angelica. Father Matthew Halloran dies the same day that Allison Parker disappears and becomes Sister Teresa. I call it! A horror and confusion expedite our glory! Is the Sentinel the only thing that stands between the mortal world and the torment of hell? Between happiness and horror? She went to a party with eight dead murderers. Eli Wallach. Doesn't everybody? Have a hat and noisemaker. Sylvia Miles. Nobody has lived in that building for three years. Ava Gardner. Martin Balsam. Jose Ferrer. Arthur Kennedy. There is danger. I swear to God, I'll kill you! Chris Sarandon. I'll kill you! Burgess Meredith. Welcome home. And Christina Raines, The Sentinel, the most frightening motion picture experience of your life, and the most revealing. Turn around. Look behind you. Be one with us. No! There is evil everywhere, and The Sentinel is the only hope. The Sentinel. 
So Jeff Goldblum reunites here with the man who cast him in his first on-screen appearance, Michael Winner, the director of 1974's Death Wish. Now, Winner was a guy who had a long career and was pretty much cranking out movies throughout the 60s and 70s. He had made over 20 films before he got to this one, but this was his first time attempting to make a horror film. And there was a lot of internal dispute as to how successfully he handled it. The movie was based on a novel by Jeffrey Convitz, uh, who also co-wrote the screenplay, and he was pretty unsatisfied with Winner's take on the movie, uh, calling him too pedestrian a director. <laughs> That's such a great insult. Direct quote. Uh, he didn't think this movie was as good as The Omen either, by the way. <laughs> That's okay. what he was saying. Uh, Michael Winter, meanwhile, was fighting with the studio on every decision. He fought to cast Christina Raines in the lead role, which he did. But in exchange, he had to give up the casting of the leading male role. He wanted Martin Sheen to play the uh, the main character Whoa. in this movie. Uh, but I guess the studio considered Martin Sheen a TV actor at the time. Uh, and they pushed for Chris Sarandon, who ended up getting the part. Michael Winner was also not Universal's first choice to direct the movie, by the way. Uh, they were looking to hire Don Siegel, um, but he declined because he wasn't comfortable making horror movies. He didn't like the genre. Uh, so he didn't do it. Michael Winner joined up. What we Universal did get to do was hire a huge cast of veteran actors that would make the film more marketable uh, because it had worked for them with airports, and they figured they'd try it again here. Uh, and that combination of esteemed great actors mixed with young talent who would go on to be famous later makes The Sentinel probably one of the weirdest movies ever to have this many big names in it. <laughs> 100%. It is bizarre. So let's run them down. Of course, you've got Jeff Goldblum popping up a couple of times as Jack, a photographer and friend to the main character of the film, Allison Parker, played by Christina Raines, who also appeared in Nashville as Mary, uh, for those keeping track of your Goldblum reunions at home. Uh, she was part of the, uh, the folk trio, the Peter, Paul, and Mary kind of ripoff. She was married. Right, right. Yeah, that was her. Uh, she's looking for a new apartment and considering marriage to her boyfriend, a lawyer named Michael, played by Chris Sarandon, who had just been nominated for an Oscar for Dog Day Afternoon and will go on to be Prince Humperdinck in The Princess Bride, which, Mike, I know that's the role that you... Uh, <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, uh, fair enough. Great movie. And, yeah, it's good to see him in it. Um, but yeah, he was Prince Humperdinck. He was also in Child's Play. He was the voice of Jack Skellington in Nightmare Before Christmas. He has been around uh, quite a bit. <laughs> but for you, he's just Prince Humperdinck, which was great. Yeah, he was only in one movie. That's all. <laughs> uh, from there, Martin Balsam, known for movies like Psycho and 12 Angry Men. He plays Professor Brzezinski, who pops up for a scene. John Carradine, the father of Keith Carradine, who starred in Nashville, uh, plays Father Halloran, the blind priest watching over the building. Ava Gardner from The Killers from 1946, uh, which I think you watched recently, right, Mike? Yes, it was on one of our Mike and Mike bonus episodes. Yes, it is. It which was. was also almost directed by Don Siegel. Oh, whoa, well, there you go. Uh, How about that? Yeah, she's in that movie. Uh, she plays Miss Logan in this movie, the realtor who sells the apartment to Allison. Uh, and then you've got Burgess Meredith, Mickey from the Rocky movies, as uh, <laughs> Charles Chazen, the eccentric neighbor who throws a creepy birthday party for his cat. Sylvia Miles from Midnight Cowboy and Farewell My Lovely. Uh, she plays another neighbor, Gerda. And her sister, Sandra, is played by Beverly D'Angelo from the Vacation movies. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> which is nuts. Uh, and she does some stuff in this movie where it's like, I don't think I can ever look at Beverly D'Angelo the same way again. It's, it's, yep. it's pretty nuts. Uh, two detectives start investigating the strange happenings that are going on, too, and they're played by one of my favorite character actors, Eli Wallach, from uh, The Magnificent Seven and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. He's Tuco in that movie. Uh, and Christopher Walken, which makes this a next-stop Greenwich Village reunion as well. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, plus, Jerry Orbach from Law and & Order and Dirty Dancing uh, shows up as yep. the film director <laughs> during a commercial shoot uh, that Allison faints during. Uh, Hank Garrett, who also showed up in Death Wish, plays James Brenner. William Hickey, who was Uncle Lewis in Christmas Vacation and uh, Dr. Fingelstein in The Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, is Perry, a guy who helps Michael break into a building. And finally, at the very end of the film, a, a man and a woman are being shown the apartment. The woman is Nana Visitor, uh, who Star Trek fans will know from the main cast of Deep Space Nine. Uh, the man is Tom Berenger from Platoon, The Big Chill, a whole bunch of movies. Uh, so that was pretty wild. You actually tweeted a picture of uh, Tom Berenger in this movie uh, on our Twitter account for the Goldblum pod, right, Mike? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty wild. That, we talked about this with uh, during Cage. A lot of those episodes would be like, wait, that's that guy for like one second. Yep. Uh, and it's one of my favorite things about doing complete work stuff is to also see other people's first roles. Yes. Uh, so it was really cool to see Tom Berenger just be there for, you know, one yeah. one line of dialogue or whatever he has. <laughs> yeah. Back then he was just some guy. And now it's like, oh, my God, that's Tom Berenger. It's so weird. 
Plus, according to IMDb, and I did not spot him here, but Richard Dreyfus is supposed to be in this movie somewhere around like the seven minute mark. He has a small cameo. He's like a background extra. Uh, wow. I did not spot him. Supposedly, a young James Woods might be in this movie too. So, <laughs> yeah, huge cast this movie has going for him. <laughs> Uh, which, by the way, the Richard Drivers thing is even weirder if he was an extra because this was after Jaws. This is like the same year as Close Encounters <laughs> came out. You know, this is like Richard Drivers was a known person. It's just very surreal. But yeah, huge cast this movie has going for it. The Sentinel, written by Jeffrey Convitz and Michael Winner and directed by Michael Winner, one year after his previous film, which was One Ton Ton, The Dog Who Saved Hollywood, which we talked about <laughs> in our Death Wish episode. Uh, right. And one year before his next film, which was a remake of The Big Sleep, starring Robert Mitchum as, uh, as Philip Marlowe, uh, which I have not seen the remake, but the original is awesome. Just throwing that out there. The Sentinel was released on February 11th, 1977, and made about $4 million at the box office against pretty lousy reviews. Although, like a lot of 70s and 80s horror movies, uh, it's been rediscovered and championed in recent years, even as a pretty nice Scream Factory Blu-ray with a ton of special features for those who might want to dive deep into it. Uh, and if you were not seeing The Sentinel uh, on February 11th, 1977, you may have been seeing the other movie that came out that day, a comedy called Thieves, starring Marlo Thomas and Charles Grodin. Uh, the IMDb plot synopsis for St. Ives. I did not <laughs> replace St. <Saint laughs> Ives in the copy, but uh, it doesn't matter. The IMDb plot synopsis for <laughs> The Sentinel, which is the movie we're talking about today, reads, A young woman moves into an apartment in a building which houses a sinister evil. So, Mike... That all out of the way, what are your overall thoughts on The Sentinel? Uh, my overall thoughts on The Sentinel is that when this movie started, I was like, oh, yeah, this is definitely going to be a, a Blu-ray pickup. Uh, I think this is like, you know, it had all the right things. It's that kind of like domestic Satanism, late yeah. 70s, huge ensemble cast, uh, you know, all the things that I I'm, I'm get excited for. And then uh, about 20 minutes in, I was like, mm, maybe not. Um, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of, I kind of lost the steam. I mean, this movie is mostly pretty fine. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's like, it has all those things that I enjoy. So on a base level, I was already having fun, but it kind of doesn't really go anywhere. It takes a long time to get where it's going. Like by the time the like scary Satanism stuff starts happening, it's yep. like, you know, pretty deep into the movie. And, um, I wish it had been, been better. You know, I feel like this has a lot of stuff that could have been really cool like like this huge cast and it, you know it's like it's got all those things and it, it just kind of flubs it i feel like you know comparing it the, the the writer being upset that it's not as good as the omen is a very valid uh, critique i would say <laughs> uh fair enough uh, i think i like this a little bit more than you did mike uh, i really enjoy watching this movie it was weird as shit uh, and it felt like the kind of weird horror movie that we would have discovered in like one of our horror movie marathons from back in the day when uh, the Hudson, oh, yeah. when the Hudson Horror Show was happening or going to the Alamo Draft House and stuff like that, or the kind of movie that you would have like blind bought from Vinegar Syndrome at some point. Like I'm surprised you don't already own this movie on Blu-ray. <laughs> I I honestly am too. <laughs> But I think you're right. It is like an hour of drama with an in, uh, with an occasional insane thing happening, and then. The final half hour just hits you with like nonstop lunacy. And from that point, like the movie's yeah. like going nuts and going crazy. Uh, that first hour, there's a okay, it's occasionally like a little like restless, I guess. But then like I feel like every 10 to 15 minutes, something else insane happens to like, OK, that'll satisfy me for a little while while we get to the next insane thing. <laughs> Right. <laughs> As we wait to see where this movie is going. Um, so, yeah, I did enjoy it. And in that respect, like it, it is it does take a while to get to where it's going. But I feel like it has just enough exciting moments in that first hour. Where I'm like, OK, I can deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was like a just miss for me. Like I was okay. real close. I think uh, if, the, if the slow escalation had been a little bit faster or or if they had somehow escalated even more, uh, if that makes any sense, because it's a lot of times it's oh, she fainted again. Ten minutes later, oh, she fainted. Uh, it's a lot of just that <laughs> happening until eventually the building, you know, weird stuff, which I'm sure we'll get into, starts happening. And then, like you said, that last half hour, I was all in. I was like, hell yeah, let's go. And it's weird. And there's, <laughs> you know, Bible quotes and demons and weird shit going on. And that's right. that's that was a blast. Of course. Now, Jeff Goldblum is in The Sentinel. He is in this movie, but he's not in that much of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. You know, his name is not in the opening credits. However, he is in the opening credits, uh, just briefly. Like, one of those things where it's yeah. like a blink and you'll miss it. And when I saw him in the opening credits, I was scared that would be the only time he actually appears in the movie. 
<laughs> it has that feeling for a while. It does. It feels like he's like a kind of like a guy who was cast for one day to do like, hey, and you know, move over here, and that's basically it. But it's not. He actually like, he doesn't really do or say much throughout the movie, but he is present in like four scenes throughout. Uh, so he's yeah. like kind of there sporadically throughout the movie. He's definitely not the focus, you know. <laughs> he's definitely mm-hmm. not a main character or even a supporting character by any means. But nope. he is there he's in the movie slightly more than richard dreyfus is apparently <laughs> <laughs> allegedly yeah so what did you think of jeff goldblum in the movie mike uh based on the very limited amount of time you got to spend with him um he has he he's in one of the scenes that's like the biggest laugh in the movie i guess uh oh, yeah. when they're at the photo shoot and he's like quick get me that other camera there it's not going to look like this for long and then all chaos breaks out and the dogs get off their leashes and the uh, peacocks end up in the pool or whatever the hell is going on <laughs> Uh, and that scene's pretty fun, um, but he's barely in anything. He's barely doing anything. And then, uh, you know, he yep. shows up at the the big party at the end when he's like, are you OK? He's got like one one line delivery or something. And that's it. So, I mean, he's fine in that kind of, you know, he's barely in this movie and the two scenes he's in. He's <laughs> he's fine. He does his he does his uh, his job. Basically, yeah, you know, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, he plays a photographer during the photo shoots um, and they mentioned, they mentioned that he's also like a friend to Allison. Like his name is Jack. Yeah. And he, they say, like, oh, your friend Jack at one point. Like somebody says that. Uh, and he does seem like genuinely concerned for her throughout the movie when he's there. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's there when she faints and falls through the glass. Right. And then he asks her what's wrong with he asks what's wrong with her at the party and that kind of thing when she like, kind of falls. And then he carries her the carries with the bed. He's like, call a doctor. And. All that yeah. stuff, you know, but otherwise there's not much to go on with this performance, uh, but he does get to play annoyance during one of the shoots for taking so long and the peacock falling into the pool and everything uh, and then concern for his friend. So it's arguably a more nuanced character than he's gotten to play in most of the films we've talked about so far. <laughs> I was just going to say that it's the most other than uh, Next Top Granite Trailage. It's the most realized character uh, yeah. that he's had so far. I would also put it behind Nashville, um, which. <laughs> OK, yeah, that's fair. which I mean, he doesn't have any dialogue in, but there's like at least like there's a character there. Like you get it, you know. Yeah. But uh, I, I would put it behind those two in terms of like character development. But, uh, you know, it's ahead of Death Wish, Special Delivery and St. Ives, where he's basically playing the same character in all three of those movies. And it's just like the generic thug. Uh, yep. And then there's California Split, which he's in for about three seconds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although, actually, speaking of, I was about to ask you, how does this role fit into the roles that we've seen Jeff Goldblum play so far? Not sure if you have an answer for that one. But honestly, I think it's probably closest to his role in California Split because he's just some guy trying to do his job. Wow. <laughs> but the main character is keeping him from doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah 100 percent. that's it you did it the same thing in both movies otherwise there's like no connection here between any it's you know it's jeff goldblum early 70s he's not really a name yet although he has been in nashville and he's about to be in annie hall so that's two movies that were both nominated for best picture uh one of them's gonna win best picture uh in the next episode we talk about so he's you know sort of known i guess he's in movies that are being seen at least and so he's yeah you know getting noticed um, but as far as like household names go, like Jeff Goldblum is not really at that point yet. No, I'm trying to remember if in his other, uh, you know, street thug roles, was he wearing like U.S. Army surplus uniform shirts? Because that's what he's wearing in this for two scenes. Right. But I, I don't <laughs> think so. No, I don't uh, believe he is. Although it is like a, a, it's a distinctive costume. Once again, I think we talked about that. In, yeah. one, in one of the episodes, I forget which one, but we said, we're like, uh, oh man, Jeff Goldblum always has like these distinctive costumes in these early roles, you know, and that might be what helped him stand out against the crowds. Mm-hmm. Like he was friends with like the costume designers union or something or however <laughs> it worked. <laughs> they hooked him up. But yeah. All right. So Jeff Goldblum's in the movie and we'll like kind of briefly mention his scenes as we get to them throughout this podcast. But what are the moments or scenes that stood out to you in this po- in this uh, in the Sentinel, Mike? Um, I mean, since you already talked about Beverly D'Angelo, and I don't think I realized that's who that was. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've never seen such aggressive masturbation before in a film. Um, <laughs> I'd like to, that's I'd like really to the only way that to as a soundbite, if possible. <laughs> Just you saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is a that is genuinely like, there's already a couple of moments before that where I was like, I don't really know what I'm watching anymore. Uh, and then right. and then that came on and I was like, this movie is nuts, <laughs> I was, you know, and it is one of those things where it's like, you know, Beverly D'Angelo in 1977. Like, I guess she wasn't really like an established name at that point. Uh, you know, the vacation movies are a few years away and that kind of thing. But it's right. it is one of those things where it's like now looking back on it, it's like it's so weird that that is Beverly D'Angelo. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that happens. That's a pretty insane thing. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, the movie starts in northern Italy where like, a congregation of priests have gathered and they're saying things like, let no evil thing approach and that kind of thing. Uh, and then it's like, you, you, you don't even have time to like wonder what the fuck is going on. And then suddenly we're in New York. Uh, <laughs> right. And then it's a modeling montage. <laughs> exactly. And then it's just the opening credits of the montage with the models and stuff. And Jeff Goldblum's there. It's your first glimpse of Goldblum. He's taking photos of Allison and her friend. Uh, and that's where you meet Allison for the first time. And uh, she's looking for an apartment on her own, uh, even though she knows she should just go ahead and marry Michael. Uh, and then a priest is like watching her ominously from the street at one point, <laughs> which is like the yep. first time that happens. The first of like 10 or 15 times that happens throughout the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, what did you think of Christina Raines as Allison and uh, her relationship with uh, Michael, played by Chris Sarandon, Chris Humperdinck? <laughs> Pr- Prince Humperdinck? Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought they were a a pretty uh, pretty fun like caricature of like upper class New York yuppie people in the late seventies. Uh, like, yeah. you know, she's a model and he's a scummy lawyer. Uh, and I loved his mustache and just like what a dirtbag it made him look like. Uh, <laughs> so perfect. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, their, perfor- their performance together is, is very uh, sweet and tender until you start to learn some more about it. Like it seems fine on the surface. And then you, uh, you know, it's revealed that his ex-wife died under mysterious circumstances and there's some doubt around who might've caused what uh, and all that stuff. Right. Um, yeah, and that was fun. I liked. I like that kind of uh, you know s- slow reveal of the 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 relationship they have. It seems like it, it, although it is odd at the beginning that she's like, yeah, we're gonna get married eventually, but like I need to live alone for now. <laughs> I'm just like, what? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was you know it seemed like her asserting her independence or whatever, like gaining control of her life and that kind of thing. We then get the news that her father is in the hospital and he dies. Right. And right. then we get a sequence that I was not sure was happening or if it was a flashback or a dream sequence or some fucking crazy thing. But she catches her father in the middle of an orgy <laughs> where yeah. where people are having sex and gouging on cake. <laughs> and, and hell yeah. You know, it's one of those things where she's there and she's like, whoa, and she like <laughs> then she runs and she cuts herself in the bathroom. And it was at this point that I had no idea what movie I was watching. <laughs> No, not at all. I was like, there's no, like, it took me a few minutes to, like, recalibrate myself, I feel like, after I saw that sequence. It's like, ah, this is a memory. Okay, some indication of that would have been good. <laughs> right, yeah, because that's, <laughs> apparently that's a thing that actually happened, but it's played so absurdly in the movie. It seems, it seems like it has to be some kind of, like, dream sequence, right? Right. And then it's not. It's, like, just a thing that actually happened, and it comes back again, like, throughout, like, her visions and stuff that she sees, like, with her father later on in the movie and things like that. Like, it all keeps coming back to that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like the defining moment of her life, but like when it's played in the movie, it's like, is this happening? Like, is this like a thing that we're supposed to like know about or <laughs> we're supposed to just accept this, I guess. Yeah. It was, it's very strange, but that whole sequence happens. And then we finally reach the building, right? Um, yes. Which the realtor who played by Ava Gardner, she's totally in on everything, right? Like she knows she has she's to, gotta be, she has to know at one point she's like, um, you know, she's touring the apartment. And it's like, well, it's only $500 a month. And it's like, well, I don't know if I can pay, you know, that amount of money. And she's like, well, you can't pay $400 a month. And like, <laughs> yeah, like really pushing the place, like that kind of thing. And it's like, I thought you said it was 500. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Ha, ha, ha. And like, <laughs> <laughs> the paper's already signed. <laughs> <laughs> so she, um, gets the apartment and is told that father Halloran lives upstairs. The, uh, the blind priest who's always watching out the window. And I think somebody at some point has the line where it's like, but if he's blind, then what's he looking at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's Allison. That's, 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 that is Allison. Is that in that scene like right there where she says that? Yeah, she's like, oh, someone's staring at me through the window. And then the realtor is like, oh, he's the priest. He's blind. And she's like, but then what's he looking at? <laughs> right. And that's one of those things where it's like oh, she's the, the realtor tells her, oh, he's always there. He's always looking out the window. And that's like one of those things where you if you're renting a place and you look up and there's just a guy. <laughs> staring out the top window i feel like you would have second thoughts about that place at least right but uh it doesn't seem like she does she just moves in yeah i i also uh wrote down i can't imagine how many millions of dollars that building would be worth today oh man. <laughs> um, it's that like waterfront brooklyn manhattan skyline brownstone yeah like, when i when i when i saw that it was like a 400 a month for that huge of an apartment in brooklyn i was like you know what i don't care if it is a gateway to hell like that's <laughs> That's prime real estate right there. That's that's a pretty amazing deal. You're never going to find that anywhere else. <laughs> no. Nope. But yeah, so after she moves in, stuff just starts happening to her. There's another photo shoot. That's when we see Jeff Goldblum again, this time trying to wrangle that peacock that fell in the pool. 
<laughs> and, right. And uh, she leaves to go answer a phone call, and Jeff Goldblum's like, oh, why not? The ship is sinking. Uh, and and that's his big line of the movie. It's pretty much his big line, other than, is she okay? Like, that's pretty much <laughs> all Jeff Goldblum gets to do. Uh, so she goes to take a phone call, and then she faints while she's on the phone. And then later, we meet some of her neighbors. That's when we meet yes. Charles Chazen. Uh, who is Burgess Meredith, Mickey from the Rocky movies. This is a year after Rocky came out, by the way, just for wow. for context. <laughs> a year after Rocky came out, Mickey was in a movie with a parakeet on his shoulder the entire time, holding a cat in his arms, uh, and he throws a birthday party for the cat, and he's dancing the polka, uh, and also he is, like, a murderer or something. Like, <laughs> Yeah. But that's, that's revealed later on. But she meets Charles Chazen with the bird on his shoulder, the cat in his arms, he kind of invites himself into her place and he's like telling her about the building and things like that. And then like right after that, she meets Gerda and Sandra and Sandra is Beverly D'Angelo. She does not speak, but she begins masturbating in the chair, which we talked about before, Mike. <laughs> and I think this may be the most insane moment of the movie to me. It is. It is just bonkers. Like just watching that. Yeah, that's the first uh, like real uh, like everything up until that point has been just like odd. Uh, right. Other than, I guess, the the walking in on her father with the cake orgy. Um <laughs> Other than that, yeah, um, of course, everything has just been kind of weird, you know, like this, this like a oh, crazy old guy that lives upstairs with the cat and the, the parakeet and all that stuff. And he yeah. gives he leaves a picture of himself for her in her apartment. Uh, but then you meet, is it Gerda and Sandy? Yeah, uh, Gerda and Sandra. Yeah. And that is just so uncomfortable. Like they're in leotards like and right. stuff. And and Sandra doesn't talk. And then uh, she starts aggressively masturbating at Allison. Right. Like, very... Alan, look, there, she's across from her in the room and she just like starts going at it. Uh, and, yeah. you know, Gerda and Sandra, are they're like supposed to be sisters, I think. But it's also implied that like, you know, they bone a lot. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot. There's a lot going on in there is, uh, is what we're saying. Yeah. She I think Allison even asks Gerda, like, well, what do you two do for a living? And I think she says, like, grope each other. And then <laughs> Allison's like, nope, I'm out, I'm out of here. <laughs> she like, which was the correct reaction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that that whole sequence happens. It's nuts. And then, you know, she kind of describes to Michael like these people are fucking weird. Uh, and then you go to the film shoot. That's where Jerry Orbach is there. Uh, and yes. he's the, you know, the film director. It's like a wine commercial. He's getting mad that Allison keeps screwing up the takes. And uh, Jeff Goldblum's also there. He's taking photos. And then Allison faints again, falls through a bunch of glass. And Jerry Orbach's like, ah, damn it. We've lost the take again. And <laughs> that's basically <laughs> it. Like, we'll use someone else's hand for the close up, which is really funny. <laughs> that was pretty solid. Uh, also, I just I, I'll talk about this in our uh, bonus episode of Mike, Mike, go to the movies. I just watched Dirty Dancing for the first time this weekend. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so I got like a double dose of Orbach uh, when I did uh, <laughs> did this this weekend. Uh, and every, every time I think of Jerry Orbach, I think of uh, John Mulaney's uh, bit about Jerry Orbach. Do you remember that bit that he has? No, I don't. It's like a thing where he's talking about um, this like romantic comedy idea he has where Jerry Orbach like donated his eyes to science when he died. Um, <laughs> okay. And so like, it's like two New Yorkers, like one's a busy businesswoman who only cares about business. And the other is like a sloppy sports guy. And they only have one thing in common. They both have Jerry Orbach's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Uh, and so that's what I think of whenever Jerry Orbach is, uh, is on screen. So that's that was great. Enjoyed seeing him uh, a lot this weekend. But yes, yeah, so he has a pretty good line there. Allison faints, falls through a bunch of glass. And then we get the big party sequence where Allison and her neighbors are hanging out. Yep. And this sounds like I, I feel like describing this movie like just in sequence. Like this is like the this is the order of events in which they happen. But I feel like it's it sounds out of sequence or it sounds out of order. This is how it's happening in the movie. She falls through a bunch of glass yeah. and then there's a big party sequence. <laughs> <laughs> yep so allison and her neighbors charles chazen gerda and sandra and a bunch of others they're all hanging out charles is throwing a birthday party for his cat jezebel open up open up surprise surprise <laughs> surprise surprise now i want you to meet jezebel's other guests everybody listen listen that's right i want you to meet allison parker she's just moved into 2a <laughs> that's right 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 come here this is Mrs. Clark from 4A. Miss Parker, dear. Hi, how are you? Glad to meet you. <laughs> this Miss Emma clark and her twin sister Lillian <laughs> from 3B. My pleasure. <laughs> Glad to have you. Malcolm Skinner, the, the Clarkkins' cousin. Mm -hmm. This is my wife, Rebecca. Hi. What apartment do you live in? We used to live in the one above you. But the ceiling leaked, so we moved to Murray Hill. They couldn't let it anymore. 
We come back here a lot. You know Goethe and Sandra. <laughs> I've a hat and noisemaker for the party. And they're dancing the polka. Everyone is eating cake. You know, callback perhaps to that uh, big cake orgy oh, that was happening before. That's it's, right. It's all done in this blue filter, and it's very, very clearly trying to rip off the sequence in Rosemary's Baby where they impregnate her. <laughs> Yep, 100%. <laughs> it's like not even trying to hide the fact that it's <laughs> trying to rip that sequence off. Uh, yeah. So that was pretty great. So what did you think of that whole birthday party sequence, Mike? Um, yeah, I mean, that was that was where stuff like really starts to go insane. Yeah. And uh, I was kind of like really into it. And I think because it's just blatantly ripping off Raspberry's Baby. Yep. And that's so much fun. That's great. That's what I love about these you know, shitty 70s horror movies is they're like, well, let's just do this other thing. This really good movie did. <laughs> Uh, but like kind of weirder. Yeah. Uh, and that's that was a lot of fun. Like the the old woman that's just like black and white cat, black and white cake, <laughs> which felt like a Twin Peaks thing. Right. Um, you know, something that like this whole sequence felt very like Twin Peaks where it's yes. just these old old people in tuxedos uh, celebrating, singing happy, like full, full singing the happy birthday song yep. to a cat to a cat full length. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was great yeah it was uh, it was pretty wild and i think like the orgy scene earlier in the movie it's one of those things where it's like it's not clear if this is actually happening at first or if it's a dream i think the blue filter kind of makes it feel like okay it's actually it's not maybe it is happening maybe it isn't like it's but i guess it is actually happening because later you find out that like you know all the stuff in the building was real or whatever or maybe it was all happening in her mind i don't know uh yeah. it's weird shit but then <laughs> after that like after she kind of recovers from the sequence she meets up with the realtor again to talk to her about the house and then my realtor has my favorite delivery and my favorite line of anything in this movie um yep. which which you know she's describing allison's describing what happened and he's like oh i met charles chasen i met gerda and sandra the two sisters and they were all upstairs they're having a party for her cats uh and the realtor's like what nobody besides the priest has lived in that apartment building for three years <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is one of those things that like it's it's such a horror cliche, but I feel like it was done so well in this movie where like just the delivery of that line, I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, so it's in. one <laughs> it's one step below. But that building burned down thirty years ago. Right. Uh which is kind of what it is, but I and I love I love that. That's so perfect. Right. And she's like, you know, the, uh, she takes the realtor back to the house and they're looking around and, and all the apartments are empty, and she's like, I could swear I was in this room last night. There was a cat and it was dancing, and like she sounds like insane. She sounds like an insane person. Yeah. All that was fantastic. Love that. But, uh, you know, as it goes on, she keeps hearing people moving around upstairs. She finds uh, Jezebel the cat eating the bird from before. Right. Uh, and then she runs into her dead father and sees a bunch of other naked old people. Like, what is this, an Ari Aster film? Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right yeah uh and she and then you know she like screams and she like sees her father and she cuts him up like she like slashes his face uh and then like runs screaming into the street uh so what, that whole sequence mike what'd you think uh 10 out of 10 perfect okay. um, <laughs> i had so much fun with that and uh i was not expecting this movie to suddenly have like a really intense gore uh you know she stabs her father and like his eye oozes out and then she right. cuts his nose off yeah, that was that was really fun. I like that. I had a, I had a blast with that stuff. That's yeah. what we're here for. That's what I, if that if this movie had been like that for the full ninety minutes, this is an instant purchase. <laughs> well, actually, we're here for Goldblum theoretically. We're oh, here, okay, we're here for Jeff Goldblum, but we're also here for weird horror shit. Uh, yeah, you're right. So, uh, and then after that sequence, the movie turns into a police procedural for about fifteen minutes. <laughs> yep. Uh, we completely abandon Allison, and we just follow Eli Wallach and Christopher Walken on the case. <laughs> And I love it takes a really long time before Christopher Walken's character has any lines. Yeah, he's, and I really thought he wasn't going to talk the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, he's completely silent for a while. And then I think eventually he like answers the phone or something. And he's like, oh, yeah, something. But they, they come to the conclusion that they think Michael killed somebody in Allison's place. Right. Because she she's right. telling the story about how she murdered her father, even though her father's already dead and stuff like that. So they're like, oh, well, there must have been some kind of body. And Michael has a history with like his ex-wife or something like what happened there. And. All that stuff. So that's when that all starts coming to light. But they also discover that all of the people Allison described at the party, the cat party, were murderers who had been dead for years. <laughs> so, yes. So there's, you know, further layers that are starting to come to light in this whole situation. So this this section of the movie, the Eli Wallach, Christopher Walken detective series uh, would you watch an ongoing series with these two, Mike, as a, as detectives? As paranormal detectives? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Just like unwittingly stumbled into uh, this kind of like hell mouth, right? Uh, like cult thing that would be incredible. Yeah, I love that. And you know, Eli Wallach's like you know the the grumbly veteran cop, and Christopher Walken's like the younger rookie. 
character. Obviously, yeah. I mean, they can't do that anymore because Eli Wallach is dead and uh, Christopher Walken <laughs> is much older. <laughs> but, I mean, there's, there's nothing stopping them from making, you know, The Sentinel 2 where Christopher Walken is the, you know, veteran grizzled cop and you have, like, the grandson right. of Eli Wallach playing, <laughs> playing his younger... He's the new Sentinel. Exactly, or something like that. I don't know. We'll, we'll workshop that. You know, get back to whoever at Universal is going to run that one. But so anyway, after that whole sequence, you know, they, they're trying to get closer and closer to the case. Allison goes to confession, speaks to a priest about her trouble, and then later goes back to the church only to find that priest was never there. <laughs> <laughs> the priest had burned down 30 years ago. <laughs> this movie pulls the same trick like three or four times. <laughs> <laughs> it's so perfect. It's great. I loved it. Um <laughs> That priest was never there. Uh, you know, the priest that is there is like, I don't know who you're talking about. You didn't talk to me. I'm the priest here. And that's basically <laughs> it. Uh, and then, you know, Allison, kind of, we kind of shift focus from Allison. Like, she was our main character for most of the movie. And now we kind of like, you know, after the whole sequence with Chris Walken and Eli Wallach, where they become our main characters for about 10 minutes, uh, then, mm-hmm. then Michael becomes the main character for a little bit. Um, and he meets up with a guy named Perry who breaks him into a building. Uh, and he finds a file on Allison, um, which is like with the other files of the people that were at her cat party or whatever. And um, they begin to kind of piece together that Allison is being courted to become the next guardian of the gateway to hell because her previous suicide attempts make her an ideal candidate because it would atone for her sins and all this stuff. It's it's crazy shit. Uh, and yeah. I, I also really like Perry's attitude towards the whole thing where Perry's just like, hey, man, I just open doors. You <laughs> you do whatever <laughs> yeah. it is you do. <laughs> So as the situation progressed, Mike, what were your what were your thoughts going into all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, like I said, the the if if this movie didn't take so long to get to the the exciting, you know, the slow escalation thing, if it was a quicker escalation, uh, I would really like this movie because that last half hour is so much fun. And uh, we skipped a scene, I think, somewhere in there where uh, Michael and Allison are at the old building and she's looking through the books and she's like, and they're all written in Latin. And he's like, no, this is English. What are you talking about? And she like writes it down and they translate <laughs> that it's like John Milton in Latin and right. all that stuff. It's like quoting Paradise uh, Lost and everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that that was a blast. I love this like kind of like domestic Satanism stuff. That's so much fun, I think. Yeah. So but yeah. And then like that kind of like turns into this weird procedural thing. And and uh, that scene at the very end also has, I think, Prince Humperdinck's uh, favorite, my favorite <laughs> <laughs> um, line reading uh, when he's reading the file. And he's like, if these are correct. The same night that Allison turns into Sister Teresa is the same day that uh, Father Halloran dies. Tonight. Which is hilarious. Like, you know, like, why would you deliver it that way? No normal human would speak that way. Right, yeah. That was, uh, that was pretty But great. it's perfect. Yeah, I love that. So uh, Michael drops Allison off at a party um, like her, that her model friend is throwing. Jennifer, I think her name is. Uh, and that's where we see Goldblum again for kind of the last time. He has he sees Allison. He sees something's wrong with her. And he's like, hey, what's wrong with her? And then Michael leaves. And, you know, he's like trying to get her safety and have her be around people and stuff so he can go into the building. And then that's when we get the shot. Uh, I think I, I might have mentioned this off mic because I, I mentioned The Exorcist before. And you were like, I didn't realize that this was ripping off The Exorcist at all. And yeah. I was like, yeah, this movie is like very blatantly ripping off The Exorcist, especially when Michael enters the building. It's like it's the exact same shot of him, like his frame <laughs> against the building with the street lights in the in the in the frame, too. And like kind of illuminating the scene and everything. It's the exact yep. same shot. It's just missing the score. Uh, and it's one of the things where it's like, I can't believe like, you know, William Friedkin didn't sue or something over this. This is yeah, insane. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so dumb. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. I don't understand how I missed that. Um, but yeah, so we get that shot blatantly ripping off The Exorcist, which is pretty great. Uh, so there's already blatant ripoffs of Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist in this movie. I mean, including a, a photographer could say uh, a ripoff of The Omen. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Especially the, the one scene when, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to cut you off. The scene when she's at the, filming the commercial uh, with the wine bottle and stuff. And we keep cutting to Jeff Goldblum, like, taking pictures. Yeah. And that never comes back. It has nothing to do with anything. The fact that he's, like, taking all these pictures of her while she's fainting and stuff. Right. Uh, but I was like, oh, it's like the Elvin. there. Look at that. Yeah, it almost feels like there should be more of that. Like, there was something more with Goldblum's character that may have gotten cut or something. <laughs> Maybe. Because as of this, at, at this point in the movie, like, this is pretty much the last you see of him. Hey, you see Allison at the party. She screams and faints. Goldblum's like, call a doctor. And he carries her to bed. And that's the it. He's a good guy. It's like, he's a, he's a good yeah. friend. You know, and he's just concerned about Allison. Um, but that's all he is. He's a photographer. And he works with her. And then he's, you know, concerned about her. And then that's it. There's nothing more to that character. Um, but because he's, like, always taking pictures of when she's fainting, you're thinking, like, oh, maybe there's something more to this. And then there's just not. It's, <laughs> it's a little <laughs> yeah. weird. Anyway. But then after all that, Michael goes into the building. He gets killed. Like, he gets killed in the building. And then Allison shows up. 
Uh, and I'm not sure how she left the party. Is there like a sequence where she like leaves the party and like people let her leave or she just like shows up? There, There's a shot when they the friends go into the bedroom. I think I think they might even be bringing the doctor in or something. OK. Uh, and there's like the camera turns and there's like an emergency door in the bedroom or some weird shit that leads to like a back stairwell. Uh, there's like okay. a, there's like a short montage of her like traveling from the party to the uh to gotcha the okay so there is a little bit of that maybe i was right maybe i was writing something down or whatever and i missed it but uh, yeah. yeah so that that happens she makes it into the building uh and she is told that she will become the next sentinel uh by michael who reveals that he is dead now <laughs> and yes also great line reading from uh, chris randon here prince umperdink where as the uh, the cat jezebel just like jumps into his arms and he's like i was killed i am doomed to eternal hell and then his face just starts cracking apart <laughs> That effect was really cool. It was really cool. I love that stuff. Yeah, that was great. Did you see the strings? I could see this. I noticed the strings. It was very funny. I did not notice the strings, actually. Uh, <laughs> Do you still have the disc? Because did you get this from Netflix? I got the disc from Netflix. I sent it back. Um, but I'm considering, oh. you know, next time a Scream Factory sale comes around, I might uh, might pick this up. I, I actually really, yeah, I really enjoyed maybe. it. I really enjoyed the movie. Uh, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I think it's worth checking out. Um, but we're getting, we're getting to like the really crazy shit at this point. So, uh, you know, that's, yes. you know, Michael's face starts cracking apart. Allison runs into Charles, uh, Burgess Meredith and, uh, all the deformed denizens of hell kind of walk through. Uh, and this, yeah. this is pretty wild. Winner, Michael Winner actually cast real people with, uh, deformities and disabilities for this part, uh, which was a controversial move at the time. And I think probably still would be, I mean, he, he mm-hmm. you know, went to like, uh, carnivals and, Stuff like that, circus uh, freak shows and things like that to try to, you know, cast these people. And granted, all these people gave their permission. I mean, they all consented in order to be a part of this. Um, but it was still just one of those things where, like, are you exploiting these people or are you not? Or are you giving them an opportunity to work? Like, there's, there's a lot of layers to uh, the yeah. use of this. But it is what it is. They use deformed people in order to make this scene creepier, I guess. And uh, it's, it's pretty wild when it's just like a whole nonstop barrage of people with deformities and also just naked people with hamsters and like you know you see <laughs> yeah. you see her dad again and he's in a diaper and you see razor blades and you, the naked ladies and all this shit it's it's a non-stop barrage of craziness for a good like five minutes right there yeah yeah that whole last sequence is out of fucking control yeah. uh and it it reminded me of freaks uh like that was it the 20s or whatever yeah that, freaks that movie is. which which also did the same yeah. thing that cast like you know people from carnival road shows and stuff to uh play those roles yeah which definitely uh you know i feel like is the obvious nod uh <laughs> in this movie sure but yeah yeah when and you know when uh allison is just like running up the entire staircase like running through the entire building i think she might hit every room on her way to the to yeah. the fifth floor <laughs> uh just screaming and being yep. chased by all these people uh it was really intense and and definitely definitely feels like uh, exploitative on some level uh i don't know it just, just didn't feel didn't feel great yeah uh but it's, it's really cool i don't know it's one of those like weird it's it. one of those weird double-edged swords of like 70s exploitation movies you kind of have to like roll with i guess you know it's yeah it's, it is what it is but then you know she finally makes it up to the room where father halloran has been sitting the entire time right and he's not there the chair mm-hmm. is empty the priest with father halloran show up at the last second and they kind of like are like you will be the new sentinel and like <laughs> A, yeah. a knife is thrown at Michael and like the dams start to like back off. And then eventually Allison sits by the window that Father Halloran once sat at. And they kind of, you know, they yes. do like the power of Christ compels you thing from the exorcist. And they all kind of like back away slowly. <laughs> like that's basically what happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but so she sits by the window and then you kind of like fade away and that's pretty much it. And then you cut to some time later and the building has been remodeled. It's it's a whole like new building now. It's even nicer now. It, like, yeah. You know, and it's probably still pretty cheap for the, that Brooklyn building or whatever. <laughs> I would guess, since it is, you know, that gateway to hell. Mm-hmm. So the realtor, Ava Gardner, is back and she's showing the building uh, to Nana Visitor and Tom Berenger, uh, who are there. They're the young couple. And they're like, oh, wow, this would be a great starter home. And it's like, this is like the perfect permanent residence, guys. <laughs> this is great. Right. This is, I love oh, how far we've fallen. I love that morning. apartment so much. <laughs> I wish I could live in that place. I mean, yes, gateway to hell. Not great. Don't love that about it. <laughs> but otherwise really nice 400 a month though exactly uh and so she tells them only one other person lives in this building she's a nun cut to allison sitting motionless in her chair blind dresses a nun movie ends uh yeah love that i think that was great it was great like cut like a final shot to end the movie on like it felt it felt like it was almost as creepy to me as like the final shot of sleepaway camp you know that one of those things where it's like (laughs) like that's one of those images that's gonna like stay in my mind forever like just because of like her face you know 
Yeah, yeah. The effect they put on on uh, Allison or Sister Catherine or whatever she is at the end, Sister Teresa, uh, yeah. and um, Father Hallahan, Hall, Hall, uh, Halloran, I think, yeah. <laughs> Halloran, yeah, is really intense. Like, you know, they, they have that, that like, you know, like plastic contact lens that's just like solid white pupils. Yes. Uh, and like their faces are very pale. Uh, so that makeup is really intense. And that that whole pull away from her out the window roll credits thing was really cool. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's the end of the movie. That's all that happens like throughout. Uh, so overall, I mean, we just kind of talk through the whole thing. I really liked. I, I really enjoyed this movie. I think it's a blast, Mike. What like final thoughts? Like, did you did this, did this discussion like raise anything for you? Or are you still just like sticking? Like, yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's mostly pretty fun. That first hour is kind of rough, um, yeah. but as far as like me being like, hell yes, this movie is great. Uh, so like, it, it's pretty good. Like, it's fine. I think. Uh, I think. I think you have the right idea. Maybe on a sale, depending on how cheap the uh, the Screen Factory Blu Ray is. Yeah. Um, uh, it might might be a pickup because, you know, I'm trash and just buy Blu-rays. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, the big question on our minds is what do you think Jeff Goldblum thinks happened to Allison? Like Jeff Goldblum's <laughs> Jeff Goldblum's character is established as like a friend of Allison. He's concerned about her. He's like, oh, man, I wonder what's going on with Allison. Uh, you know, is she OK? I got to get a doctor for her. And then she's gone. And then presumably he never sees her again. Like, what do you think is going through yeah. his mind? <laughs> I guess he probably thinks they died or, or disappeared or whatever. Cause Michael's also dead. The, the, oh, right, the boyfriend, yeah. which also when Michael, um, when she, like she, she gives Michael like custom cufflinks earlier in the movie, like right. gold, like ML. And later on she finds them covered in blood. And that's when you realize he died. It was great. That was really yeah. good. <laughs> Just throw that out there. Now was John Carradine Frankenstein in all these movies in the, no, sorry, not these movies in like the <laughs> hammer films and stuff. Cause he's, he's one of the, like the fifties era actors in all those movies and stuff. Right. Um, I'm not. Yeah, I, I will tell you, I'm not like mega familiar with John Carradine. I mean, he's the head of like the Carradine acting dynasty or whatever you want to call it. Right. You know, it's, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like David Carradine and Keith Carradine and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, because I know he's he's in that era of like you know Peter Cushing and sure. Christopher Lee and like those kind of movies. So, but I was just thinking about like at the end, he looks very much like Frankenstein would in those movies. He definitely and, does. And uh, and it's a fun touch that this movie has him even in it at all, like we talked about. Uh, actually, yeah, you're right. He was a uh, he played the Count Dracula in House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula, the Universal monster movies. Uh, so, oh, okay. so not the hammer horror stuff, although he was also a big uh, John Ford guy. He was in a lot of John Ford movies. He was in Stagecoach, mm. Man Shot Liberty Valance, uh, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, Grapes of oh, Wrath yeah. and a lot of good stuff. Now that I think about it, this was Universal, so it must not have been har- uh, hammer horror. It must have been the Universal horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so John Carradine also very creepy in the movie, too. But yeah, a- any other stuff kind of throughout the movie you wanted to briefly mention, Mike, before we start moving on to letterbox reviews? No, I think we kind of hit everything. I was really impressed by the like sudden gore effects uh, yes. and the makeup in general in this movie. Uh, that was that was a fun thing that all of a sudden started happening, uh, which kind of is this whole movie where like it's kind of going along. It's doing this thing. All of a sudden it's a police procedural. Yep. OK, we're doing that. <laughs> all of a sudden we're at the mouth of hell. Uh, OK, right. all right, sure. Yeah, it's a movie that turns into like five or six different movies as it goes on. Um, but it's, yeah. it's I think it's pretty good at being most of those movies, at least. So uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it is the Sentinel. You can get it on Screen Factory Blu-ray. I don't. You can rent it on Amazon. I think for like two bucks right now. Yeah, uh, so, yeah that's how I watched it. Okay, cool. So yeah, it's worth. Uh, I think. I think it's worth a look, especially if you're into like you know weird, undiscovered horror gems. I feel like this is one of those that like. I mean, it has enough of a cult following where it's like semi well known. I think, but it's not like you know, mm-hmm. it's not The Exorcist. You know, it's not. <laughs> despite how <laughs> it's hard, not even the Yeoman. Dis- despite how hard it wants to be The Exorcist, it is not The Exorcist. <laughs> it doesn't have yeah. quite that following. But all right, let's move on to letterbox reviews for the Sentinel, Mike. Uh, we got a four-star review here from Holly Horror, which reads, When you have seen many, many horror films, there comes a point in your movie watching where you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel more often than not. Thankfully, every now and then, you come upon a somewhat well-known horror film you just haven't got around to watching yet, and it turns out to be a solid film. That was definitely the case with the Sentinel. Another downside of seeing so many films is that by the 35-minute mark, I have the plot figured out, and that did not happen with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what was going to happen or exactly what the reasoning was behind the ongoing happenings. There's a decent collection of actors, eerie atmosphere, good makeup effects, and a cat in a party hat. What else could I ask for? And on a side note, we'll never be able to watch the vacation movies and look at Beverly D'Angelo the same again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually really funny. I mentioned now that, that, that re- you're reading that review where it was like, you know, a sort of well-known movie. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned to my parents, so I was like, because oh, they are always looking for movies to watch now that we're all in quarantine. Sure. Uh, and I was like, yeah, you know, I got to watch the next thing for Goldblum. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the Sentinel. 
and they were like, oh, wasn't that like a weird horror movie? Like they knew what this movie was. Really? And my mom was like, yeah, there was a book I remember too, right? And oh, I was wow. like, what the fuck? <laughs> Anyway, uh, your parents have been secretly into super weird horror movies their entire lives, and they've kept that from you, Mike. Like they they have, have they been watching my Blu-rays. They have their own stash of Vinegar Syndrome Blu-rays, every <laughs> single spine. <laughs> like, wow. you'll, like you'll hit a button in your living room one day, and suddenly the entire wall is going to flip, and <laughs> just it's all Blu-rays. It's an illuminated wall of Blu-rays. Yes, uh, <laughs> all Vinegar Syndrome, Scream Factory, all that stuff. It's going to be great. Uh, How dare they? Anyway, here's a four-star review. <laughs> Uh, from Justin Liberty, once again, uh, of the Alamo Draft House and uh, Vinegar Syndrome and all that stuff. Uh, few things in 70s horror cinema can invoke the potent dread of Jezebel the Cat's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> Only the director of Death Wish 3 could make a horror flick this batshit. From Beverly D'Angelo masturbating in bright red leggings for an audience to the bare skin laden parties that make Rosemary's baby soirees seem tame, and then the climax with enough deformed extras to make Fellini take note. Uh, and it makes proper use of 70s New York City locales. Has amusing bit parts by Ava Gardner, Jeff Goldblum, Christopher Walken, Eli Wallach, Jerry Orbach, and Martin Balsam. Creepy blind priests are the fucking worst. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's a good one there. Here's a three-star review from Liam Hathaway, which reads, Yes, it steals loads of ideas from The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby. And yes, I disapprove of Winner's use of real people with deformities in one particular scene whom, in Winner's defense, must have consented. But The Sentinel is just so compulsively weird and contains one of the freakiest scenes ever put in a horror film, straight up, a trashy but vastly underappreciated chiller. On a personal note, I've stood outside the creepy brownstone apartment on Montague Terrace in Brooklyn, New York, and couldn't shake the unpleasant feeling that a craggy old blind priest was up there in that top window. <laughs> 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 Which I would like to like see. Like I think if that, that apartment building must still exist, I guess. Um, I guess I guess it must like still exist and I think it would be great to go there and just like you know place like a cardboard cut out of a priest in the top <laughs> in the top of our book and just leave it there and see if anybody notices it then that'd be awesome I like it uh, here's a three and a half star review from Thomas Ringdahl it reads I'm in the process of moving into a new flat not a wise choice to watch this right now <laughs> <laughs> having second thoughts about this move need to look at need to check out who lives at the top that's for damn sure I think I picked this film a bit randomly and was more and more dumbfounded as one famous name after the other came up on my screen during the opening credits. How is this not more well-known, I asked myself. Sure, director Winner is best known for his Bronson collaborations, but the cast alone should have left this with a legendary reputation, right? Turns out, it's not as brilliant as the cast. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> casting director Sis Corman went on to cast Once Upon a Time in America, The Deer Hunter, Raging Bull, and Heaven's Gate after this, so obviously I'm not the only one blown away. But it does have some very freaky scenes. Unfortunately, the time spent between these highlights drag quite a bit. The kind of kind of your same review, Mike, where it's like, eh, there's yeah. a lot of drag in the movie. Finally, got one more here. It's a four star review from Chance, possibly Chance the rapper, but right now it's just Chance. <laughs> <laughs> possibly, can't confirm. Can't cannot confirm if it's the rapper or not, but it's some guy named Chance. Possibly one of the strangest horror films out there, not for its content per se, although the content is pretty strange, but for its star power. Ava Gardner, Christopher Walken, Jose Ferrer, Eli Wallach, Jeff Goldblum, just to name a few. But there's so much more. Even the background extras are somebody, i.e. Richard Dreyfuss. I don't know how Michael Winner did it. Was he blackmailing them? <laughs> or, or did they all think this would be the next The Exorcist? I'm thinking the latter. However, it's not The Exorcist. Not even close. It's more of a mutation of all these satanic and paranoid thrillers of the late 60s and 70s, and yet it still stands on its own. I mean, while it's like this film or that film, none of those films are like The Sentinel. <laughs> and the climax undoubtedly proves that. Uh, I like that idea. Like, The Sentinel, like, yeah. rips off a lot of other movies, but, like, no other movie is, like, quite like The Sentinel, I feel like. Like, it, it is a very insular, singular experience watching this movie. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a pretty positive note to end on, I think. Yeah, there you go. So that is The Sentinel. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Mike's a little bit more mixed on it, but overall, I would say go check it out. Uh, I think we would both say, like, yeah, watch it if you're into this kind of, if you're into this kind of movie, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as, as far as Jeff Goldblum goes... He's barely in it. If you're only watching these movies, if we're selling you Jeff Goldblum's in them a lot, then I'm sure you haven't been able to watch a lot of these movies. <laughs> but yeah. hopefully that's going to change soon. It won't change in the next episode, but hopefully it will change soon. Uh, so thanks so much for listening to The Complete Works. Oh, I didn't even ask you, Mike. Where can we find you online this week? <laughs> oh, it's it's the same as every other week. You can oh, find really? me at MD Film Blog on Twitter and Letterboxd. 
<laughs> and you can find me at uh, Emma Smith Film Blog on Twitter and Mike Smith Film on Letterboxd, Radio Mike Sandwich on Instagram. You can follow this podcast at Goldblum Pod and our other podcast, Mike and Mike Pod, on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening to The Complete Works. I'm Mike Smith. It's Mike Decretio. Don't forget to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast app. And you can find the rest of our podcast in Rapture Press alongside the Review Zoo, a podcast about comic books and movie news and all that nerdy stuff. Uh, our theme song was created by Kyle Cullen. Our logo was designed by Jacob Honeycutt or at Jacob Honey on Twitter. You can join us next week on The Complete Works where we'll be talking Jeff Goldblum's role in the movie that beat Star Wars for Best Picture in 1977. That's wow. That was a big controversy at the time. Controversy by, like, nerds, but still. Uh, <laughs> Woody Allen's Annie Hall is the movie we're talking about next week. I'm sure we're going to have a lot to say about that one. Uh, it's available on the Criterion channel right now if anybody wants to uh, check it out. It's part of their uh, their new collection of uh, 70s style icons, uh, which Diane Keaton mm. is the one from Annie Hall who's uh, kind of part of that uh, collection there. Uh, and we're putting out bonus episodes of Mike Might Go to the Movies while the quarantine's going on, so check those out too. Thanks so much for listening, guys, and remember to go for the gold bloom. I feel like a dummy that I didn't think of The Exorcist. Not once <clears throat> during this movie? Not <laughs> once. I was like, 10 years is a long time to make another Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> um, I mean, Rosemary's Baby is definitely a factor also. But uh, yeah, but there's there's even one shot in the movie that like explicitly ripped off The Exorcist. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, I was, yeah, uh, I was so dumb. <laughs>